Swift to welcome your arms to embrace. 
It is an honour to be invited to deliver tribute for this wonderful man. To say Hamish was a one-off is to underestimate the case by miles. We can't forget his presence here, sitting over there with his rainbow scarf, harapping when he didn't agree with the sermon, <laughs> the whistling of his hearing aid broadcast over the church's PA system, sotto voce comments delivered at foghorn volume, the intense conversations over coffee, the papers he wrote lined up for us at the back there to take and read, the postcards to the Prime Minister for us to sign, his passion for justice and peace, his presence in the cafe, the long and loud conversations with Vincent and Gary, hammering out Heidegger, Kant and Karl Marx. But also his love for people, his generosity, and his interest and concern for the young people in our congregation. I confess that I only really got to know Hamish properly in the last year of his life. Although I first met him when he joined an Alpha course in our house uh, about 15 years ago. Can you imagine Hamish in Alpha course? <laughs> the Alpha course talks were delivered uh, by Nicky Gumbel. Uh, by means of a video and TV screen. It's very good that Nicky wasn't in the room, as Hamish had full reign to critique his presentation, expletives not deleted. We certainly had animated discussions, and it's not difficult to imagine that. All of us here have personal experience of much of the above, and we loved him for all of it. Well, almost all of it. But I don't want to leave it there. I want to ask the question, what was his gift to us as a church? There were many, but what would it boil down to? Put all together, I believe his greatest gift was to make us think. To make us think about the world we live in, politically as well as environmentally. To think about the church, especially the Church of England and St John's. To think about the way we think about God, which is theology. Don't just go with the flow, don't just accept the status quo, think. At the heart of all of this, and at the heart of Hamish, was his profound conversion to the way of Jesus. He spent an hour a day in meditation and prayer, and he loved Jesus. With his Bible in one hand, the Guardian in the other, <laughs> theological and philosophical tomes in, in the other hand, he thought deeply and radically about current issues and made us do the same. He wrote papers and sponsored a website. He told me two or three months ago he had finished writing. But I found two more papers on his computer, <laughs> uh, which he wrote since then, and they will be available on his website. Thank you, Hamish, for all you gave us. For just being exactly who you were meant to be.
My husband and I have known Hamish since the 1980s. Nick met Hamish soon after he moved into Oakland in 1981, and Hamish subsequently hosted many musical parties for the talented and musical children living in the road, which included Nick and his sister Sophie. I then met Hamish in 1989, a year after I met Nick, which felt like an introduction to the wider family and also a test, <laughs> which frankly I seem to pass. Uh, unlike another test, which I've already failed without knowing, we worked out some years later that my GCSE music composition of 1988 had been used by Hamish at a national conference as an example of how not to do it. <laughs> <coughs> so I knew him from what felt like the dawn of my adult life to the dusk of his, and the last time I was able to hug him was when Richard and I took him into his care home in our son. He was someone incredibly special in our lives, a mentor but also a friend, who was so close and invested in us that he became more like family and our children treated him as an honorary grandfather. But Hamish was blessed with family as well and was very proud of his stepchildren and their partners and children. Miles and his partner Claire will be attending the committal with their son Sam and his fiancée Danny although Sally and her daughter Emily are sadly not able to join us in per person. Hamish decided to jointly best us as his executors because, like many long-term couples, we have had a tendency to specialise and become codependent. As an accountant, I'm known for dull paperwork, mm -hmm. and Nick is the creative spark. As one of a partnership, though, I was even more in admiration of Hamish as a strong single person. Yet he was never embittered by this state, or seemed lonely. Because first among his many talents was one for deep friendship. Both for creating friendships, but perhaps more importantly also for nurturing them. This has really come home to us in the past two weeks, as so many people have recalled to us their gratitude for his friendship and his skills as a friend. And how good he was at maintaining those friendships. How it had helped them in their lives, and how they've been shaped as a person because of him, and my goodness also how they have been challenged into thinking and debating, and let's be honest, at times outright arguing with him. One of the ways in which he was a particularly gracious and generous friend is the way in which he would greet with equal joy the delivery of a true kitchen disaster or a call of blurdish. <laughs> and indeed, that is possibly because he was also capable of delivering both himself. <laughs> Despite having a mother and a brother who were restaurateurs, Hamish would often be so involved in the evening's debate that the niceties of the timings of the his dish required would fly out of the window until he suddenly leapt out of his chair shouting things like, Oh, fish! <clears throat> Undoubtedly, the oven would be blamed. He was convinced that anything with a plug on was conspiring against him. <laughs> His rages at everyday things were such fun to watch. He would react to the smallest of problems, such as an email disappearing into drafts, with arms whirring around his ears, an energetic shoulder bounce, and sometimes a shout of, go! <laughs> Yet the real challenges in life, his knee replacements, heart surgeries and deafness were met with stoicism and calm. It can't be helped, he would say, it simply can't be helped. Hamish provided Nick and I with endless opportunities for education in music, food, wine and culture. He was terribly fond of architecture, probably because of his musical career in so many beautiful buildings, King's College, Salisbury Cathedral and so many more. One of his many gifts was a wonderful memory, sharp as a pin until just a few weeks ago. And he knew, and more importantly, could so easily recall a huge store of history. When he came to see us at university, we would visit an old house yawning from having been up until two or three the night before, accompanied by a narration which was always more saucy and better informed than that being given by the official guide. We always found out how the family Duke had really earned his money, and the love lives of the family, delivered of course at a volume that more or less drowned out the real guide. <laughs> if I reflect on what Hamish meant and gave to me, he meant support, wisdom, challenge, debate, and the importance of real research and independent thought. What he gave to me was a feeling of well-being in his presence, and a sense of being really listened to by someone who actually and unusually put their own ego aside to listen. A 
and a sense of being loved for the best parts of me by someone always looking for the best, because he was bound to be optimistic about the human race. I shall remember Hamish often and with a smile. When we cleared his flat last summer, it was a pleasure and a privilege to enact his letter of wishes whilst he was still alive and to see the joy that it brought him. So we now have, in private place in our hall, Hamish's grandfather clock. As I come downstairs, I look upon his face and I think of Hamish. Tall, very loud, <laughs> with an enormous impact and creating a background tick of support and love in my life. Thank you, Richard and Jane. We're going to stand now and we're going to say together Psalm 42, so please stand. We'll say this antiphonally. I'll start with verse 1. And if you could join in with the even number of verses. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and eat with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with the shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of Jordan, the heights of the home, from the Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By the day, the Lord directs his heart. At night, his song is with me. A prayer to the Lord. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer more to agony, as my foes taught me, saying to me all day long, Where is your God? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. Glory, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. We continue to stand as we listen to the hymn, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind.
reading is from the first letter of Peter, chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold, that, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. It was a feature of Hamish's love of theology that, ironically, during our several lengthy conversations over the last 15 months, we never got round to discussing the exact details of what he wanted at his funeral. In fact, we never even spoke once about it because we were too busy talking about what was exercising his brain at that present moment. And that seems fitting, but it's also, to me, quite amusing. So we were very, very glad that he had chosen a piece of classical music which will be played at the crematorium, which is based wholly on the first letter of Peter, chapter 1. And therefore, it seemed very obvious that that should be our text. And it's also fitting, I think, that we came to that text via music. Hamish's first stirrings of faith began, as many of you will know, when he sang the psalms and other sacred music as a young chorister and thus became firmly rooted in our beautiful Anglican choral tradition. He was obviously very talented musically from a young age and his spirituality was deeply shaped by what he sang. And he would attest to this fact himself in his memorable story of coming to faith. This story he would tell quite frequently, and it seems to me a great template for all of us to think about um, when we think about our own story and how we can share it. I expect some of you have heard. So he first imbibed the gospel, as it were, through sacred music. But then his faith somewhat atrophied as other parts of his life took over. It wasn't really until his retirement that someone challenged him to take his many questions about faith seriously and join a church. This eventually led him to St John and St Stephen's where he found his Christian family. What was so inspiring about Hamish's faith story was that it clearly illustrated that as he grew, his faith grew with him, and it became a very robust faith. It became a faith fitting for a person in later life. It was realistic, grounded, and irked into the many issues that face the world, such as climate breakdown and justice in political life. In his faith story, he was able to articulate the development from experiencing the beauty of sacred music to experiencing the beauty of Christ in prayer, something that was his joy to do each day. Alongside his intellectual engagement with God, Hamish developed kindness and openness to new ideas, both traits that made him a delight in church and cafe. Not only was he a valued theological resource, discussing for hours as we've heard in the cafe, or later whenever a pen a notebook was handy. He was also generous, courageous, and truthful. Even when expressing frustration and even contempt for the machinations of the Church of England, he did so for all the right reasons. Because he, more than anyone, 
knew that full-blooded faith in Christ was a matter of heart and soul, and not merely religious observance or the latest management speak. He took seriously the depth of the anti-Christian forces at work in what he named the principalities and powers that he believed were grasping onto our economic and political systems. This is what stood, how he stood apart from somebody who is championing social justice without that insight into the spiritual realm. His theology of engaging the powers stemmed from, partly from his experience of the Reading Jubilee debt campaign, where he noticed and was very exercised by the fact that local Christians were keen to give to the poor, but not so keen on asking why they were poor, or at least not in church. The passage from 1 Peter reminds us that our faith is a living faith because it's founded on the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This puts death into a completely different light. As Richard said when he spoke last Sunday, or the Sunday before, about being with Hamish as Hamish was dying, and how that had helped him to rethink death and get it into a different perspective. Because ours is a living hope, we can be confident that when we commend Hamish to God at the end of this service, and commit his body to be cremated at the next. Hamish himself will be safe with Christ. He will be waiting expectantly for the resurrection of his own body, along with those who look to Christ as Saviour. So in Christ we have fellowship with Hamish, even though we don't see him any longer. But his death is nonetheless a great loss, and those of us who are still grieving We'll need to be gentle on ourselves. Grief can take us many ways, and it's best to let it play out as it will, however long that takes. I hope as we go forward into this new year, we will be able as a church family to continue Hamish's legacy by engaging with the papers and discussing amongst ourselves, and perhaps in the wider Christian community, what it was that Hamish was so fuelled by theologically. It won't be easy because the more one engages with the way the world is, even the way the church is, the more one sees what is wrong. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead was, if you like, the ultimate engagement with the powers. The powers of evil that would silence goodness, fairness, truth and innocence. Christ faced the ultimate human challenge by being obedient to death even the death of the cross, and defeated it by rising to incorruptible life. This was the nature of Hamish's hope, and this is our hope as we gather to say goodbye to one from our family who was so very well loved. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. A prayer of thanksgiving. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us all with the gift of this earthly life, and who gave to Hamish his span of years and gifts of character. God our Father, we thank you now for all his life for every memory of love and joy, for every good deed done by him and every sorrow shared with us. We thank you for his life and we thank you for the rest in Christ he now enjoys. We thank you for giving him to us and for all that he meant. And we thank you for the glory we shall share together through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A prayer for those who mourn. Father, the death of those we love brings an emptiness into our lives. Be with Jane and the whole family. Be with Nick and we particularly think of Hamish's stepchildren and their families and bless all of us who mourn. Give us confidence that Hamish is safe and his life 
complete with you. Bring us together at the last to the wholeness and fullness of your presence in heaven, where your saints and angels enjoy you forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A prayer of penitence and for readiness to live in the light of eternity ourselves. Lord, may our grief lead us to a truer living, and may we be given grace to give over to you all the things which might separate us from each other, things past and things present. Help us to live lives of trust and openness that we may prepare ourselves for eternity through the saving love of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We stand and listen to the hymn, Love Divine, or Love's Excellent.
and entered into glory. Confident of his victory and claiming his promises, we entrust our friend and brother to your mercy. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, who died and is alive with you, now and forever. Amen. 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 